Welcome to Mind, Muscle, and Metabolism, the Jade Tita Podcast. Here you get the in-depth science and practical tools needed to change your body, optimize your health, and elevate your mindset. I'm Dr. Jade Tita, and here is what I want you to know. You are different. You are as unique on the inside chemically as you are on the outside physically. And those differences matter. They matter because there is only one rule to achieving optimal health, fitness, and body change. That rule, do what works for you. My goal is to help you understand exactly how. I'm so excited you're here. Your transformation starts right now. What's up, everybody? Uh, Welcome to the podcast. This episode is... By request, actually, just a ton of people saying, hey, Jade, keto's all the rage, and I want your take on it. Can you give us the science, etc.? So that's what I'm going to do. This one may be a little bit longer than what I typically do. I typically like these to be 20 to 30 minutes at the most, but I will try to um, do my best to keep it short. First of all, one thing to know is that I have a free course on the keto diet. It's Dr. Jade dot com slash keto dash course drjade.com slash keto dash course that will give you a lot of the information uh, that I may not cover here or more in-depth information I think it's about an hour long maybe a little bit longer than that of me on a whiteboard sketching all this stuff out if you want visuals so let's get into this the keto diet what is the deal with this well here's what you need to understand about your body your body has several different fuels that it can use it's kind of like if you can imagine it's sort of like you know if we had a uh, a house that could pull in energy from the sun maybe from a wind farm maybe from an electrical grid that's burning off of coal this is the way you want to think about the body it has lots of different ways to get the energy it needs now it's two major sources of fuel that it likes to burn is either sugar or fat. Now, of course, the interesting thing about this is that sugar can be made from certain amino acids. So the body can break down amino acids primarily that are stored in the form of muscle or that you eat in the form of protein and make sugar in a process called gluconeogenesis. Glucose newly made is how that translates literally. And also, uh, sugar can be made Um, From the breakdown of fat, believe it or not, fat is broken down into glycerol and free fatty acids. And that glycerol molecule can also be made into sugar in gluconeogenesis. So amino acids plus glycerol, and then you can make your own sugar. This is important in a minute that you'll see with, uh, you know, ketosis. But so we have sugar and fat. We also can sort of burn protein indirectly by making sugar and then burning that protein. And we also can, when our sugar resources dry up, we also can use fatty acids and amino acids to make ketones and then burn those ketones. Now, the interesting thing about this is that your body is actually using all of these fuels all of the time. It is burning fat, it's burning sugar, and it's burning ketones. There are certain uh, parts of the body that will use ketones at sort of low levels, and you have ketones being produced and being burned in your body all the time. It's just how much. If you're eating a lot of sugar, the body tends to burn that sugar. If you're eating more fat, the body tends to get a little bit better at fat. If you're not eating much sugar at all, the body will need to make ketones. And the reason why is because some things, like the brain most importantly, absolutely require, cannot burn fat directly. It requires either sugar or ketones. And so this is where this becomes important. And the body is a great, uh, you know, sort of machine at being able to pick and choose its energy sources. And there are some benefits to having high amounts of ketones and switching your body over into ketones. The metabolism, a truly healthy metabolism, is a flexible metabolism, a metabolism that can choose between different energy sources. An inflexible metabolism is one that we don't want. And many people, because they live primarily on 
high sugar foods, high starch, which is broken down into sugar foods, they become very inflexible in their inability to use multiple energy sources. And this is uh, pretty typical of the insulin resistant diet type two diabetic who as they eat more and more carbohydrates and sugars more than anything else, they have very high insulin levels. And this insulin is there to try to drive sugar into the cells so the body can use that sugar. But over time, the body goes, well, I am becoming more and more insulin resistant because I have high amounts of sugar. I need high amounts of insulin. And it becomes only able to burn sugar. It stops being able to burn fat efficiently. And then eventually, as that progresses, it even has a hard time uh, burning sugar as well. And you can see this clinically, actually. When people come into the clinic and you do blood labs, you'll see typically they show up with high fasting triglycerides and a sort of normal to high normal blood glucose level. And then all of a sudden, as things progress, you'll see high blood sugars as well as high triglycerides. What that tells us is typically people you lose the ability to burn fat first, efficiently first, and then they start losing the ability progressively to use sugar as well. And that ends up in a really difficult situation with type 2 diabetes. What if we could make the metabolism far more flexible so it can pick and choose between these fuel sources? That is ultimately what we are trying to do when we go on a keto-based diet. Now, here's an interesting thing to understand. Most people live in a constant state of glucose eating. They're either eating starch or sugar sources, which break down the glucose, and their body learns to become efficient at glucose usage. We eat so much glucose, actually, that our body stores it away as glycogen, and we have our tanks, storage tanks of uh, fuel for glucose tapped out and our storage tanks for fat tapped out as well. And so we have all this glycogen stored in our muscles and liver, which is the storage form of glucose, and we have all this fat stored in our adipose tissue, or our fat tissue. And most people, if you look at them, are walking around with excess fuel stored on their body and an inflexible metabolism. So a lot of what we're doing just at a high level conceptually is we are being in a position where we want to make the metabolism more flexible. Think about our hunter-gatherer ancestors. They had to live with the seasons, and because of that, they had to have flexible metabolism. So in the summer and early fall, food would be abundant, animals would be fat, starch foods would be more rich, fruits would be available. This was an eat more, exercise more time. They were moving a lot, eating a lot, and in this time they would use more sugar. And this is probably good because sugar is sort of like high octane jet fuel for the body. The body can perform at high levels with it um, compared to maybe fat. Fat is something that we need to get from one point to the other over long distances. It's more efficient, which is why aerobic exercisers and marathoners, you know, basically use a little bit more higher percentage of fat when they're exercising than maybe sprinters do who use a higher percentage of sugar to burn during their exercise. So there is some relationship to activity here. But in the summer, that's basically what our hunter-gatherers were doing. They were using sugar. But as we moved into winter, the end of fall and winter, what ended up happening is animals were more sparse. We couldn't find them as readily. They were also becoming leaner. Many of them were hibernating. Fruit and vegetable matter and starches and things like that were not available. And so we were eating a higher fat diet and higher protein diet with virtually no carbohydrates and or fasting for longer periods of time for days on end as we were searching for food. And this put us into a ketogenic state during the winter, which was beneficial at that time for the metabolism to switch into using ketones because if it couldn't, it would not be able to get its fuel source from sugar. And so the body would not be able to survive. And then, of course, when spring came around, it would sort of switch back in to a little bit more sugar usage. Now, the interesting thing is, is fat and ketones are not the same thing. However, ketones are made, the body can make both sugar from fat by the glycerol and also can make ketones from fat, right? 
So this is important to understand. So what we're trying to do when we go on a ketogenic diet, at least from my perspective, is it's a really great way to help the metabolism become flexible again. I like to do a keto diet every winter now as a way to reset myself. But it's not something I like to stay on indefinitely because we want a flexible metabolism. So one of the things that I would throw out there, and this is my opinion, is that if everyone was following keto diets all the time in the same way that everyone is following high sugar, high starch diets most of the time in the Western world, we would probably end up with conditions of excess keto uh, diet effects, meaning that, you know, any diet that you do for a long period of time, the, the metabolism just isn't used to that. It's used to being flexible. It's changeable. It evolved in a environment where uh, seasons were there. Even in, in hotter climates, there still is a growing season and, uh, you know, uh, times when there's going to be abundant food and times when there are not just based on environmental circumstances and things of that nature. So just at a high level, keto diet is really about helping us be more flexible. We don't typically, the average American, the average Westerner doesn't typically spend a whole lot of time in a keto diet. So from my perspective, a month, two months, three months in a keto type approach is a great way to stay flexible and keep yourself lean. And so that is very important to understand. Now, what exactly is a ketone? Well, a ketone is uh, a compound that can act as an alternative fuel source to go into the mitochondria and produce energy ATP. Now, for those of you who aren't biochemists, you can skip over this sort of uh, explanation here for a minute. But for those who really want to know the science, here's the way to kind of look at this. As sugar becomes less available, whether because of environmental circumstances or, or whether because you're, cur you're purposely cutting out glucose-related foods, what will happen is the first thing that will happen is your tanks of glycogen, your glycogen storage tanks, that the storage form of glucose will begin to become depleted. Now, the body still needs to get energy. So what it's going to begin to do is it's going to start to look at other fuel sources. So for a while, for the first few days or so, maybe it will start saying, well, I've got some amino acids sitting on my muscles or I'm eating protein still. I will use those amino acids to make some sugar. But after a few days or so, the body's saying, well, that's not going to work for me because I can't waste my muscle. I need that to get around to go look for food. So I better find another source here. Not to mention, I can't use those amino acids directly on my brain, and my brain is running out of the energy required. There's not enough amino acids to make enough sugar in this gluconeogenesis to support me. So I better ramp up another form of energy production. And so after about three days or so of depleting yourself of glucose and the body saying the amino acids are not going to cut it, I better ramp up my ketone production. And so all of a sudden the body starts to take and divert its resources to breaking down fat and turning that fat, parts of that fat into uh, ketones. And so what ends up happening is uh, the fatty acids, so fat is broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. And so the fatty acids are being made into ketones along with ketogenic amino acids and the glycerol that is created from that breakdown of fat along with gluconeogenic uh, amino acids ends up making uh, the small amount of sugar that is still required for certain certain organ systems, for example, um, the red blood cells and things like that, right, um, or the the liver and that kind of thing. Uh, so what ends up happening is, is some there are some organ tissues that cannot use uh, ketones and will need the small amounts of sugar. Red blood cells being one, liver being another. Uh, obviously, the brain is going to can use ketones and will divert divert its resources into ketosis. Now, for those of you who are wondering, one of the signals that the cells get that this is required is oxaloacetate is a compound that when sugar is being burned, you're forming a lot of oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA that basically goes into the water wheel of the Krebs cycle and then uh, stimulates a lot of uh, NAD and FAD production. And so the, for those of you who aren't biochemists, you can ignore this part. But for those of you who are, uh, you probably understand what I'm saying here. And then these NAD and FAD 
basically go down into the uh, the electron transport chain and drop off their electrons to produce energy, to create this sort of energy current that generates ATP. So one of the things that happens is oxaloacetate uh, is sort of an internal signal to the body that they better, it better start getting uh, ketone production ramped up. And so ketone productions begin to be formed. There's three major types of ketones. There are, uh, are three ketones formed. There's uh, acetate or acetoacetate, right, which is uh, the major form that will start pouring out into the urine. There is beta-hydroxybutyrate, BHD, which is ma BHB, which is made from acetoacetate. And then there's acetone. And the liver is doing most of the job, the job of making these ketones from the fatty acids coming from fat. It's important to understand that fat is not ketones. They're not the same. However, fat can be used to make ketones in the liver. Fatty acids can. Okay? So hopefully that, that makes sense. Now, some of this that you need to understand is that acetoacetate is measured in the urines. When you get keto sticks and you pee on them, that is acetoacetate that you're measuring. Beta-hydroxybutyrate can really only be measured primarily in the blood, and acetone can be measured in the breath. And this will have ramifications in a minute in terms of how we measure whether you are actually in ketosis or not. And so the thing that is really interesting here is after about three days, your body will start ramping up acetoacetate first and acetone, and then you'll start seeing beta-hydroxybutyrate ramp up as well. Beta-hydroxybutyrate, BHB, is the major ketone, and technically it's actually not a ketone. Technically, biochemically, it's a hydroxy acid. It's not, it's not uh, chemically uh, the same as acetone and acetoacetate, which have... Um, just, just for the, the, the organic chemist, uh, a ketone technically has a carbon that is attached to two, two methyl groups and then a double bond to an oxygen. Well, you won't see that exact same structure with beta-hydroxybutyrate, but we call it a ketone because it is used in the same way that acetoacetate and acetone are used. And actually, this is the one that has all the benefits, many of the benefits uh, in that we associate with keto diets because it can generate more acetyl-CoA for the, for the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain than acetoacetate and acetone. It also has some stabilization properties in terms of stabilizing the neurons and the nervous system, et cetera. So I know this is getting really complicated, but hopefully you understand, just to review really quickly, that really we, we want a flexible metabolism. And when the body does not have sugar available to it, it will begin to burn fat. Some of that fat will be used directly as energy, but other organ systems like the brain cannot use fat directly as energy, so then ketones are made. And ketones are then used by many different organ systems in the body, and they have benefit in terms of, in the case of beta-hydroxybutyrate, can generate an awful lot of acetyl-CoA for energy production. And this is a good thing in, for short periods of time for the body, both for survival and health benefits, which we'll get into uh, here in a minute. So, interestingly enough, what you now know is that in order to go into ketosis, you obviously need to be very low glucose. For most people, this is going to be less than 30 grams of total carbohydrate per day. Now, everyone's going to be a little bit different here. I've seen people get into ketosis with around 70 grams of carbohydrate intake per day. I've seen others that have to go you know, below 30, way below 30. I've also seen individuals who can keep their protein intake as high as 25% or 30% of their total macro intake. And I've also seen people that have to go down to 15% protein. Now, why would protein matter? And why does this matter in terms of individual uh, aspects of metabolism? Because obviously some people will drive more gluconeogenesis with high amounts of amino acid. The body prefers to make sugar if it can, because that's an easy source of energy for it, and making ketones is a little bit more costly for it. And so if it has enough protein, it will gladly make uh, glucose from that. And that's why oftentimes one of the biggest mistakes people make when they go on keto diets and can't get into ketosis is because they're 
carbohydrate intake is too high, obviously, and it needs to be pretty low, less than 30 grams for most people, or their, and or their protein intake is a little too high. For most people, I think you're pretty safe if you're under 20% protein intake as a total macro percent, you're going to do pretty well with staying in uh, ketosis. Now, how do you measure this? Now, many people make the mistake of measuring it in the urine, right? They measure it in terms of uh, keto sticks. Now, this is not measuring beta-hydroxybutyrate, which has most of the beneficial effects. So really what you want is you don't necessarily want ketonuria. You want ketonemia. What is the difference? Ketonuria means ketones in the urine. Ketonemia means ketones in the blood. And there's a resting level of ketones in the blood all the time. You know, so trace amounts, maybe 0.2 millimolar or 0.5 millimolar. You want that to come up to between one and three millimoles per liter when you are in ketosis. So you want to measure in the blood, preferably beta hydroxybutyrate at levels between one and three millimoles per liter of beta hydroxybutyrate. And this is one of the mistakes a lot of people make because acetoacetate will spike over the first three days, then it will fall off as beta hydroxybutyrate ramps up. You can still be in ketonemia with beta hydroxybutyrate without seeing acetoacetate showing up on these keto sticks. And so those of us who do this in a serious way almost always use blood uh, ketone meters to get the levels that we want. Now, you also can measure acetone that comes out in the breath because that's more correlated with BHB. And they do now have, um, many people are starting to come out with uh, breath meters, like ketonics being an example. So many of us who do this on a serious level will measure our breath acetone first and along with, I'm sorry, not first, but along with our blood levels to correlate the two. And then because these blood keto meters are so expensive, sometimes up to $1 a strip, we'll move over to just the breath meters because it correlates better than urine. So those of you who want to get serious about this, that's what you may want to consider. Now, I know this particular podcast is getting very technical, um, and I understand, I understand that, but for most people who follow me, they know the basics of the keto diet. They want sort of the, the advanced version of this, so I'm trying to to give this to them, but I will cover in just a minute. How do you know if ketosis is good for you or not? We'll get to that in just a minute. So now at least we have an understanding that why would ketosis even be beneficial? Um, Because we want to create a flexible metabolism. Obviously, if you're trying to burn fat, we can see ketones are made from fat. Now, one thing that's really interesting here is ketones have a pretty profound uh, suppression of hunger. As we're seeing in the research, we think the ketones can be pretty hunger suppressing. Now, fat in and of itself, this is another confusing factor here. Fat is not satiating. In fact, fat, and and people always get upset about this, but if you look at the research, you'll see fat in itself is not the most satiating macronutrient. Protein is, and then fiber-rich carbohydrates probably next, and then fat. However, fat with protein is highly satiating. And once you start making ketones, that's highly satiating as well. So this is one of the reasons why people get a little bit confused about this. A protein-fat combination, which without glucose can be satiating, partly because of the ketones being um, released. And this is important because you have to understand you still need a calorie deficit. Keto diets do not help you magically lose weight. The reason they help you lose weight potentially is because they suppress appetite to the to the extent that it makes it very easy for you to achieve a calorie deficit. Not always, though, which is why the reason why some people can still overeat on a keto diet. Keto diet foods, if they're doing a lot of, you know, you're doing a lot of fat, which can be calorie rich. And if you're doing too much and overeating still, you may not lose fat on a keto diet. You still must achieve calorie deficits. Keto diets tend to make that far easier because you're not hungry. So hopefully that makes sense for you. So this may tell you in the beginning, in the first one to three days, you may want to keep your 
protein intake up a little bit as you decrease your carbohydrate intake and then you want to slowly bring your protein level down as you ramp up your fat intake more and more and this should get most everybody in that one to three millimole per liter bhb category on your keto meters um, so this is important to sort of understand now how would you know that this is something that would be useful for you or not this is funny, right? Because obviously we've talked about the idea that the metabolism is a compensatory device. It will compensate. It is a thermostat. And so oftentimes one of the major drawbacks of keto diets is that people can get very, very big cravings for sugars and things like that, especially after the diet. Once you get into the diet, if you're able to do the first one to four days or so, you don't typically, cravings for sugars and things like that will typically go away, but coming off a keto diet, coming back onto sugar, you can have a binge eating effect. And this would make sense, right, for our hunter-gatherer ancestors coming out of a keto state during the winter and then getting a taste of some honey or something a little bit sweeter and a little bit more starchy and then being driven to get more of that stuff to for fuel because in general across the board for our hunter gatherer ancestors fuel was relatively sparse we needed to really you know sort of maximize our fuel sources so if we came off came across a source of honey or something like that we wanted a mechanism to trigger our brain to say oh my god this is so good this is addictive i want more and more and more of that well now in modern day if we get that sugar after not having it for a state of time that can trigger a lot of overeating which is why we still have some people who go on these keto diets and then end up with extreme binge eating behavior for days weeks months after the keto diet which can be really really tricky and so this is one of the downsides to this another downside to this is that in the middle of a diet like you're trying to do 12 you know 12 weeks of a keto diet and then you end up at a friend's house who's having birthday cake because it's their birthday and you have a piece and it pings the brain like oh my god that's so good and next thing you know you're on a binge eating of fat and sugar which is the worst thing that you can do and your metabolism you know sort of goes back into the state of storage and so people who do keto diets can end up in these extreme swings back and forth if you're somebody who's susceptible to some of those brain chemistry issues and these craving issues, you may want to be very careful with a keto-based diet. And so hopefully that makes sense to you. It's really about does a keto diet keep your heck in check and allow you to, to maintain a effortless calorie deficit? If so, then it probably works great for you. If not, it's probably not going to be good for you if you end up going to extremes during and or after the keto approach. That is important for you to understand with this, right? So that's how you know. You're always playing metabolic detective. Now, what are the benefits and the risks of being in a keto state? Well, the benefits are that ketones, we're having so much emerging research telling us that ketones are obviously hunger suppressing, so you can more easily get in a calorie deficit. You're also in a ramped up fat burning state at that time, which if you have a calorie deficit means that fat is dissipating rather than, you know, sort of being stored, right? So that is important. It can really aid people in their weight loss efforts. The other thing that's really interesting is if you look at the biochemistry and the level of the cell, sugar produces a lot of smoke. So if you imagine a, a energy factory, you know, it's burning off coal, sugar is a lot like coal. It creates a lot of smoke, a lot of free radicals, a lot of potential cellular damage. Whereas um, something like ketones is burned much more cleanly and you don't get as much smoke it's far more stabilizing it has free radical quenching properties it also stabilizes because of this a lot of our nervous system which is why it's very good for people who suffer from things like parkinson's and things like maybe alzheimer's and it's been used for for hundreds of years actually probably you know for all we know maybe even thousands of years for people with epileptic seizures and things like that it is highly stabilizing to the nervous system very beneficial in that regard it also may have some cancer suppressing and maybe even cancer fighting properties we do know that fasting is being seen as a major way to potentially combat 
cancer and keto diet is sort of a fasting mimicker. So we get a lot of the same benefits that we would get from fasting while following a keto diet. And so all of these can be highly beneficial for us. The other thing that keto diets can have beneficial effects on our immune cells and be beneficial for many people who have autoimmune diseases, keto diets have uh, been shown to potentially be effective there, at least in clinical practice I have seen this. And we're even starting to see that they can be beneficial for things like acne and all of those kinds of things. So putting yourself in a different metabolic state for a period of time and letting your metabolism get more flexible, flexible can have profound benefits for people when they're doing a keto diet. Now, what about uh, the downsides? Well, a lot of times people get confused with what is ketosis and what is ketoacidosis. Understand that when you move into ketosis, nutritional ketosis is what we call this. What is happening is blood sugar levels are dropping, insulin levels are dropping, while ketone levels are going up. This is a highly beneficial state for the metabolism to be in and a normal state for the metabolism to be in. Obviously, we went into ketosis periodically throughout the year as hunter-gatherers and probably most winters, especially when we were living in environments that had a real winter. But even in uh, tropical settings, you're going to go into ketosis at times when food was not available for whatever reason. And so that is a very beneficial, this nutritional ketosis is very beneficial. However, if you're someone with a damaged metabolism, and by damaged metabolism, I mean you are very insulin resistant, your pancreas is damaged to the effect that, you know, you are type 1 diabetic with damaged uh, beta cells in the pancreas and not making uh, insulin and or you're in a position where you are uh, you know so insulin resistant that blood sugar levels stay high in the blood then what happens is you can in these particular situations end up where blood sugar stays high while insulin is high in the case of type 2 diabetes or low in the case of type 1 diabetes and you end up with high blood sugar and high ketones this is potentially a bad thing or ketones that go way over the limit of maybe uh, five millimoles per liter uh, although i have seen people that are really in nutritional ketosis at about 10 actually but once you're going to see very very high ketones in um, ketoacidosis and what ends up happening is these ketones can change the acidity of the blood. It gets far more acid than it's supposed to, and that can be life-threatening. But that is a very different thing than keto, than ketosis, nutritional ketosis versus ketoacidosis. So monitoring your blood sugar along with your ketones, uh, you should be able to understand this. Almost no one who has a healthy, flexible metabolism will ever get into ketoacidosis. These are only people with diabetes. Now, that being the case, many type 2 diabetics end up really uh, able to uh, cure and heal their diabetes from a keto-based diet, and they never get into ketoacidosis either. So ketoacidosis is a state of a disease state. Nutritional ketosis is a very healthy state of the metabolism. So that is very important to understand. Now, really quickly before I end this, what about these keto uh, esters and keto salts and medium chain triglycerides and these keto supplements? Should you be using those or not? Well, here's an interesting thing to understand. If you add in keto salts, which when you see keto supplements on the market, they're almost in the research, you have two types, keto esters and keto salts. Keto esters seem like in the research they do a better job of getting us into uh, ketosis and can have some of the beneficial effects that uh, metabolic ketosis or nutritional ketosis gets us into. It can get us there a little quicker. Keto salts can do it as well, right? Keto salts can do it as well. But the interesting thing is that think about what you're trying to train your body to do. You're trying to train your body to be flexible, to be able to make ketones and use those ketones effectively, both make and use. Well, whenever you put ketones in, and basically these keto salts are basically beta-hydroxybutyrate combined with calcium or potassium, magnesium, that kind of thing, and then you eat these, and then the body uh, takes them in and then uses it as energy. But if you are using these exogenous, right, exogenous means from an outside source, exogenous keto salts, your body is not making endogenous ketones to the same degree that it would, right? Endogenous meaning making from the inside, exogenous meaning 
uh, getting from the outside. That is a theoretical concern here in terms of the benefits of this particular diet. However, they can potentially have use for you to help you get into ketosis a little bit faster and avoid this ramp up period. So for example, during the first one to three days of trying to get into ketosis, we could potentially take some of these keto salts, these keto supplements, and get ourselves using these ketones a little bit faster and take away some of the downsides that can occur with people as they switch from sugar usage to ketone usage. Because one of the things that happens in clinical practice is that many of us have seen people go into what we call the almost keto zone. They're decreasing their carbohydrates, and so their body can't run off sugar anymore, but they're not ramping up their ketones to the degree that is necessary to feel better and function better. And so they end up in this place called almost keto zone, which feels pretty bad, actually. It does not feel good. Headaches, brain fog, all of these things. Partly this happens for many people because they don't go low enough in carb or they're too high in protein or they're not high enough in fat. These keto salts can help us manage this one to three days better or manage sort of people who stay in ketosis, let's say most of the week and then come out on the weekends, it can help them get back into that ketotic state more quickly. And so they do have some benefits. Uh, we are starting to see some research. I think it's largely overblown at this point in time, but we are seeing some research saying they could have some performance benefits, mainly in elite runners and, and cyclists, but most of us are not elite runners and cyclists. So we are seeing that they may have some benefit in performance enhancement, but at this point in time, in my reading of the research, I think that's largely overblown. And so I'm not so sure you need these things. Um, one thing that is maybe a little bit more useful in my mind right now, and this might change with emerging research, is the use of things like medium chain and short chain triglycerides, which are different than longer chain fats. These short chain fats that are present in coconut oil, things like lauric acid and caprylic acid and butyric acid, these things are not metabolized in exactly the same way longer chain fats are. Longer chain fats have to go through the lymph and then they get to the, they have, they have this long pathway of getting through the digestive system, going through the lymph, and then they get to anything that's left over and not used gets to the liver and then the liver may make some ketones out of them but these medium chain and short chain triglycerides go directly to the liver and they can be more quickly made into ketones when we need it so if we're in a fasting state or we're switching over into ketosis these can be really useful because they help provide uh, some of the raw material to make our own ketones so to help us make our own endogenous ketones versus the keto salts which are you know exogenous ketones and not letting us use our own keto making machinery. So I prefer when people ask me, hey, what kind of keto supplements should I take? I prefer the medium chain triglycerides, the short chain triglycerides, these short and medium chain fats pre pre present in coconut oil, butter, etc. And a lot of people say, well, should I get MCT oils? The, the benefit of that could be that caprylic acid tends to be a little bit faster in its ability to make ketones based on some of the information we have. But the truth of the matter is that coconut oil and butter do a great job. And this is where some of you who don't understand what people are doing with butter in their coffee and, and coconut oil and things like that are doing, what they're doing that primarily for this effect. These things can have energy producing effects in the body when we are in low sugar states. Now, when we're not in low sugar states and we're not in a ketotic state, whether or not these are benefit or not is debatable. Um, some people find them beneficial, some people may not. And this is where you go back to your own individual nature. Do these things keep my heck in check or not? Or are they just adding extra calories? Ultimately, in the end, we're doing all of this so that we can achieve two things, metabolic hormonal balance and flexibility and a sustainable effortless calor calorie deficit. So why would we just be adding these things in for the hell of it? We're adding them in so that we can have flexible uh, metabolism, balanced metabolism. How do we know that? Hunger, energy, and cravings, sleep, mood, exercise, performance, exercise, recovery will all be in check and a sustainable calorie deficit. How do we know that? Well, we're losing fat and inches, right? And so we have to look at these things in context. You don't necessarily want to just add these things in 
for no reason. You want to have a reason for doing them. But from my perspective right now, there's really no uh, need to be doing keto salts. Keto esters really aren't available yet on the market. But there's no real need to do keto salts unless you're just someone who's like, I'm training really, really hard. I notice the difference when I take them. But you may find more benefit from the medium chain triglycerides because they act activate our own machinery to make these ketones, right? So I know this is a big long, I mean, I'm talking super fast and I'm rambling on, et cetera. But I wanted to do this really quickly because so many people were talking about it. Now, if all this is confusing for you and you want sort of uh, the whole thing over again, go over to drjade.com slash keto dash course, drjade.com slash keto dash course and you will uh, get more of this information but just to sum it up here's ultimately what we're talking about here why would we want to do a keto diet in the first place because having a flexible metabolism that can run off sugar when it needs to and fat when it needs to and uh, ketones when it needs to and use amino acids to make different fuels when it needs to is highly beneficial we want a flexible metabolism our body is built for that and so there is benefit to spending time in a high sugar state and a high training state at times like our hunter gatherers did and there's benefit at times to being in a ketotic ketosis state nutritional ketosis state like our ancestors did at times this has benefit for our dna has benefit for our brain has benefits for fat loss has many benefits this is what the metabolism likes to do it likes to have this changeable metabolic state so that is highly beneficial. Now, we also have to understand that fat and ketones are not the same thing. Fat can be made into ketones, right? Fat can also be made into sugar. Remember, fat is split. Triglycerides are the way we store our fat. That is split into glycerol and three fatty acids. The three fatty acids can be made into ketones. The glycerol can be made into sugar. This is what we want, actually. This is how we burn our fat. And our body will not begin to burn that fat substantially until it is convinced all its sugar resources are gone. So that's part of the benefit of this. There are three ketones formed in the body, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. The one that has the primary benefits, makes the most energy, has, contains the most energy, and has the most stabilizing and balancing effects on our metabolism is beta-hydroxybutyrate. That is primarily measured in the blood. And it does correlate more closely with acetone, which is measured in the breath, than acetoacetate, which is measured on keto sticks. And so that's why you probably, if you want to get serious about this, use either breath measuring devices and or the... Uh, blood measuring devices to measure ketonemia. Then we have to understand that we want one to three millimoles per liter showing up on our, you know, so that we are in ketosis. We know that we are in ketosis and we're getting the benefits. We want to avoid almost keto zone by making sure that our sugars are low enough and our amino acids are low enough and our fat is high enough to generate this metabolic state. Just think about what would you be eating if you were, you know, on the tundra, walking across the tundra. Every once in a while, you might find a fatty moose or something like that. You might have stored some fat away, some lard away back at your hut, and you might be eating any of the foliage that is around, you know, barks and green leafies and, you know, grasses and things like that. But you're certainly not going to find tubers growing around. You're not going to find fruits going around. You're not going to find a lot of sugar things around. You're going to be either eating very lean animals, very fatty animals, or roughage. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you're going to be eating. So you want to duplicate that uh, for your keto diet. Those are the things you want to kind of keep in mind. Supplements, keto supplements are not necessary. They can have some benefits. Experiment with them. They can perhaps be a benefit for you. And medium chain triglycerides are probably the best way to do this and sometimes the most enjoyable way. And by the way, I'll say this, if you're going to start this, do not start keto salts and medium chain triglycerides in high amounts quickly. Notoriously, this will cause digestive upset. The same way you don't want to start you know, eating a huge amount of fiber if you haven't done it before, but that will cause some digestive upset. So move slowly into these supplements make sure you are measuring your blood sugars are they coming is blood sugar coming down as ketones going up that's the most ideal state a low blood sugar and high ketones is the most beneficial state here 
And for those of you who are dealing with health concerns that you think a keto diet may be uh, beneficial for, then you just want to make sure that you know this is working for you if your hunger, energy, and cravings are in check while you're on the diet and it doesn't cause binge eating behaviors during the diet, you know, being four days on ketones, coming off because you're binging, or then after the diet, having spent two months in ketosis and then coming out in four months in binge eating behavior. These are all the things that you want to uh, keep in mind. So I know that this was very technical. I hope those of you who stuck with it got something out of it. I've been rambling on a little bit while, a little while now, and I'm going to end this podcast here. But definitely give me feedback on this one. Let me know what you think, and I will see you at the next podcast. Pop it in real quick just to say thank you so much for your interest and support of the JTTA.com podcast. I am bringing back by popular demand the live Q&A calls I used to do back in the day where you can get on live with me, ask your question directly, and have me answer it in full. Questions about thyroid and adrenal health, autoimmune disease, any health condition, belly fat, muscle building, performance enhancement, you name it, we are going to cover it on the Q&A podcast. If you'd like to be on these live Q&A calls with me and speak to me directly, all you need to do is become a patron of the podcast. You can go to www.patreon.com backslash jtita. That's www.patreon.com slash Jade Tita, become a patron of the podcast. I would greatly appreciate your support and you'll be able to access me live to answer all your questions in depth. Thanks again for your support. See you on the podcast.